Amada Sheni Lamalchut. But now stands the second to the king, the Mishneh Melech, the viceroy. Mechamad Shara'ah Hashem Melech meets the Armaod. Because that he sees that the king is in a lot of pain. Vikesh. And he yearns. She'd no lo misharet vesu sumaot shel hotaot. He asks for the king, for a servant, for a horse, and for money. Vahalach levaksha. He wants all of these things so he can go look for the lost princess. Vaya mevaksha maod zaman marub maod am shmatza'a. And he would search for her for a very long time. Very, very long time until he found her. From here now, moving forward, we're going to speak about how he looks for her until he finds her. So, we have a beautiful introduction to the hero of the story, the protagonist, the one who is going to elevate and save the princess from being lost, the one who's going to take out. Uh, simcha, joy of the Jew, which is in exile, and to bring her back to her rightful place, right next to Hashem. And already he's setting the tone for this. That prior to this world, we know according to Kabbalah, a person's neshama, a person's soul is tasked for their mission. That we sign up, so to speak, for mission impossible. That we're going to come down to this world and we're going to lift up the Shekhinah from the dust. And this is what Rav Natan Zal, the main student of Rabbi Nachman, says is going on in this story. That this second to the king is every single Jewish soul. And we come down to this world. And like he's going to explain here, we're going to ask for a sus, which is a horse. A horse always represents the archetype of physicality. So whenever the Torah is speaking about horses, and you see it a lot, or King David says, people trust in their horse, but I trust in Hashem, it means that people trust in their own physical body. The sus always represents the physical goof. So he's asking, help me to have a, a, a horse that I can go look for her with, meaning give me a physical body that I could go down to this world with in order to find and elevate the lost princess. Umasharit, and what about this um, servant? So, <clears throat> according to the commentary, and Rav Ari Kaplan brings this as well in his parish, that the servant is actually one's mind. Now, it's interesting because we usually think about ourselves as our mind. But we know that Be'emet, in truth, even when our mind stops functioning properly, or even Chas Khalila, someone goes into a coma and they lose all functioning so to speak, or at least conscious functioning of their mind. But still they're alive. So how are they alive? How are they there if their mind's not working? If we always associate ourselves with our mind, that's who we are. So then if our mind's not working or it's not functioning properly, how do we still exist? So obviously the answer is we're not our mind. We have a mind. <laughs> so what is the mind? The mind is supposed to be a servant to the soul. And this is very important to know, because as long as we don't realize that our mind is supposed to be serving some purpose, it's not existing in and of itself, just so it can uh, see everything that's going on. But instead, your neshama was given certain tools to be able to achieve its purpose. Or like a soldier who goes into war, he's given a, a weapon and he's giving artillery and he's given his gear, right? He's not given that weapon so that he can go into the neighboring village and chas v'chalila um, cause a ruckus. He's given that weapon to protect himself, right? He's not given that, 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 that gear that he has in order to swiftly move in a way which is negative for himself and which is damaging for others. He's given that gear so that he can go on this very heroic mission to save his people and therefore he's camouflaged on the way. So too, one of the things that becomes very clear according to Hasidut and even the Torah itself is to stop associating ourselves with our body, right? To stop associating ourselves even with our mind, that we are not our physical um, 
constituents. We are not our tools that we have been given. They are tools with which we have been disposed to utilize, but they are not us. And once that becomes clear, then I become a master of those tools because I realize that they are only tools. They're not me. So instead of, let's say, letting everything come into my mind, because that's what everybody in the secular world does, you know, whatever we see uh, is good. Why? Because it's happening. So let my mind think about those things, right? Any thought that pops in my head. I have to think about this. Why do I have to think about this? Because I am my mind. So it's coming into me. Or like we're learning right now that in actuality, you have a soul which is removed from your brain. And you were given a brain to utilize in order to help you find joy in your life. But it's a tool. So now all of a sudden, now that I know it's a tool, so there's certain effective ways to use a tool. And there's certain ways that are damaging to a tool. You know, if I take uh, my hammer and I leave it outside in the elements, so it's going to rust. So what do I need to do? I need to make sure it's in its toolbox. So to the mind, uh, it needs to be fresh. It needs to be filled with positive content. It needs to be filled with um, hope. And if I'm filling it up with other things like negative thoughts or like negative images, right? So that's like the rusting of the hammer. This is a tool for us to use. And that's what the Mishnah Malik, that's what the second to the king, which is really us, asked for before coming down here. That we should have a mind to use to strategize how to take the Shekhinah out of exile, how to take joy out from hiding. Uma'ot ala hota'ot. And to give me money. What was the money that he wanted? Parnasa. Like we know, as a person gets older, they start to get married, or even they just become an adult and they need to support themselves. Right? It says in, uh, in Pirkei Avot that... Uh, there's Derech Eretz comes before Torah. It says elsewhere that Derech Eretz and Torah go well together. And there's many different allusions to, so to speak, this harmony between physical sustenance and spiritual sustenance. That somehow within the tikkun of the world, that our ability to lift up the Shekhinah from the dust, it's not like, oh, I just happen to have to work because I need to eat. No, nothing has to be. Hashem created this world in a specific way for a specific reason. So the fact that we need to uh, find a way to support ourselves financially in order that we should have time and the peace to learn and to do mitzvot um, and to help others do the same, that's not coincidence, that's not happenstance. Somehow, this is all a part of the tikkun ha'olam. This is all a part of the healing of the world. So he asked, can you please also physically sustain me? Give me parnasa, that I'm able to go do what you need me to do. And this fits in well with the statement of our sages, that one of the things that's determined before a person comes to this world is how much parnasa he's going to have, right? So we see here that this fits well. Why? Because it seems like the Mishnah Melech is speaking to the king before he starts his journey. That is uh, analogous to the Jewish soul speaking, so to speak, to Hashem, prior to its coming down into this physical world, to go look for the Shekhinah, to look for the lost princess in this world, and requesting certain things for its mission. So let's see what the Mephor says here. V'keshi no lo mesharet v'susu ma'ot alot av alach lavaksha. The sus, the horse, this is the person's body. Umasharet, hu nefesh, or seichel. This is the person's consciousness, his, his intellect. Ki aide seichel da motzi ko mine tachbulot umashar timoto. Because with a person's mind, he's able to develop strategies to elevate the Shekhinah from the dust. Umasim lo bavadat Hashem. And to assist himself in serving Hashem. And we see here as well, this is the whole Ikar of Hippodadut. Why does Rabbi Nachman say a person should go into a secluded place without any external distractions? That he could speak to his heart and he could speak to Hashem um, like he's speaking to a best friend. So one of the main um, benefits of this practice is to be able to think clearly. Because it's impossible to think clearly when you're on the hamster wheel. 
But if I take a moment and I'm able to go outside or I'm able to go in my car or I'm able to go in a secluded room and I'm able to sing a little bit, to dance a little bit, to speak about good points about myself, to speak about uh, miracles that have taken place in my life, whether they're revealed or whether they're hidden, whether they're obvious or whether they're enclosed in nature. I'm trying to uh, allow myself to experience joy. What's the purpose of all that? So that my mind could be lucid. Because once my mind is lucid, it's clear. I'm able to then use that mind to develop new strategies to help me to overcome struggles that I'm having. You know, let's say for instance, um, I know that whenever I watch like X, Y, and Z movies on Netflix, I lose all of my steam. Like it's like, it feels good, right? At the time, like I wanna watch this movie, I wanna watch this show, I wanna hear this music video because I need like some type of relief. I just wanna like chill for a little bit, you know, take some time off from the whole spiritual mission of saving the world and just uh, relax and watch something, yeah? So, <clears throat> but then you notice afterwards, like even though the movie is an hour and a half, you kind of lose your motivation afterwards to learn or to pray or to connect on a deeper level to do it, dude. Something happened after that, right? And then let's say you do this multiple times, but you don't really put together in your head that this is kind of making you lose your steam. So now what's the purpose of Hipoda dude? That like through my Hipoda dude, I'm like thinking to myself, what is it that's causing me not to be able to achieve all my potential? Where am I losing out, so to speak? You know, like when I do a, in, in business, we do a, a check on all the, the supplies that we have. I want to see what went missing. What do I have? Uh, how did it go missing? You know, how do I make the most profit for what we have, for the supplies that we have? So too with ourselves in our life, you know, am I achieving what's possible for me? As is what am I doing effective? Is what I'm doing true to me and where I'm at right now? Am I being honest with myself about where I'm holding? You know, can I be doing more in certain areas? Are there ways for me to be more effective in what I'm doing? So in that place of Hippoda do it, that's part of uh, what it's there for, Cheshbon Nefesh, to be able to uh, analyze myself where I'm holding and where there's room for me to grow and also where there's room to, for me to be more effective. So now like I'm thinking to myself, oh wow, you know, I realize like every single time I watch a movie on Netflix, I kind of chill out even for like the next six hours after that, even though I really only planned on chilling out for an hour and a half. So maybe there's something that's going on with this that's like cooling me off. So how do I develop a strategy that allows me to elevate myself beyond this. So I have to put up some certain structures, certain borders. Like maybe I say to myself, you know what? I'm gonna have a designated time every week that I watch this movie. Instead of saying to myself, you know, every day, whenever I want to chill, I'm gonna go watch something. Instead saying, I have a time every week that I do this thing, right? That's a strategy. If I try to uh, deal with it head on and say, that's it, from now on, I'm not watching anything, yeah? So you feel like a huge sonic and then all of a sudden you have a hard day at work or your parents say something that bothers you or you have a struggle with a friend or you just start to have some self doubts about things and you feel stressed. So then what happens before you know it, 10 minutes later, you have a Ben and Jerry's ice cream in your hand and you're watching 10 movies, right? So what happened? I thought I wasn't going to watch anything anymore. I deleted all of my YouTube from my account. Okay, so no, it doesn't work like that. You have to be, you have to know where you're at. And you have to work slowly, slowly, and you have to be smart with who you are, where you're at, constantly be looking to grow, but from where you're holding in a smart way. So like you know, the Gemara says, you have to be tricky with the Yetzirah. So what do you do? Say, no, I'm not gonna say I'm not doing this anymore. I'm just gonna say there's a set time for me to do this. And in this way, I'm not a slave to it. I'm utilizing it for my benefit to relax, right? And then Bez with Hashem, you know, as time goes on and you grow and you develop more and more, then your, your time is filled up and you feel so infused by the spiritual journey that maybe you don't even want to do this anymore. You don't need that same relief. You can get it in other uh, uh, means, right? 
That's all figured out through your mind when you're thinking clearly after you've attained joy in your hipotidun, okay? So that's all, all these steps going together. So that's why he asked for the mind. I want the mind so I can strategize, not strategize how to trick this guy in business so I could be a millionaire. No, that's not what the brain was given for. Your mind was given to you so you can strategize how to get the Shekhinah out of exile. Or more specifically, how do I attain joy in my life? Right? Another example, like let's say for instance, you used to work out all the time and now all of a sudden you became Baal Tshuva, right? You started to realize like, oh, I want Hashem in my life. So you start learning, you start praying, you start doing different things. Well, let's say you used to play guitar or whatever. And so you stop doing all these things and you realize like there's like a certain heaviness in your life and you don't know what the heaviness is from. You know, and every day, like you're dealing with this heaviness and you don't know what it is. And then I start to do both of the things, you know, what, what, what used to make me feel so good? Oh, I used to like make music. I didn't play for anybody. I wasn't, I wasn't like playing on a concert tour, but I remember there was like an hour every day that I would sit and I would play music and I would write lyrics. Um, and I realized that that made me feel really good. That was like, that was like soothing for my soul. So that's a mitzvah to do that. That's a mitzvah. That's a mitzvah like learning. That's a mitzvah like praying. If this thing is kosher and it brings you joy, it's a mitzvah gedola to do something like that. So now, like, how do I reincorporate these things in my life that I used to do in a way which is kosher, but in a way that I still have what I need? That's part of using your mind to strategize. Yeah. So it might be that now I'm not working out at uh, the New York Sports Club because, uh, you know, I'm going to see a thousand things that I'm trying not to. <clears throat> but that doesn't mean I don't work out anymore. I might have to get creative, you know, like, the, like they did in the 80s where they took their laundry things and they like just like lifted them up in the back. Yeah, it's the old rusty pipe and they start to use that to right, whatever. You know, you have to be very tricky and you have to be very creative. That's part of what he voted it is for. Utilizing the mind that you've been given to create new strategies to find spiritual joy and, 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 and just emotional joy in your life in a way which is healthy for you, to surround yourself with positive people. You know, asking yourself, you know, every time that I hang out with this person and they start telling me like the newest conspiracy theories uh, about what's going on in the world, do I feel like better after that? Do I feel closer to God after that? Do I feel more Meshiva Nefesh? Do I feel more peace of the, of the soul? Or am I starting to think to myself, oh my gosh, do I need to start collecting canned goods in my the back of my house just in case the whole world goes to, you know, and, uh, and I need to be prepared for, um, for Armageddon. So you realize like, oh yeah, I really do like this person and I care about them. But, um, but I realize every single time that I speak to them, like literally everything that I was working towards and, and, and moving towards just kind of goes into exile. So... You know, King David says in the beginning of Tilim, <clears throat> Ashrei, fortunate is the person who doesn't walk with negativity, he doesn't stand with negativity, he doesn't sit with negativity. This person, he sits and learns Torah <clears throat> and, uh, and everything he does is successful. So why doesn't he start out by saying he sits and learns Torah? Why does he start out by saying, Ashrei, wow, fortunate is the person that he doesn't hang out with anything negative, any one negative because clearly you see from King David how much uh, a person's surroundings, how much a person's uh, hevra, their crew, you know, who are, the, who, who are your boys? Who are the people that you hang out with? Are they positive influences in your life? Are they bringing you to clubs? Are they bringing you to gamble? Are they bringing you to this? Are they bringing you to that? Or even just more personally, are they constantly um, speaking about things which are antithetical to what I believe in? Are they constantly bringing me down? Yeah. So that's not a good friend for me on my journey. Now, how do I have the strength to be able to, let's say, remove myself or extricate from myself that situation, at least temporarily? I need to first recognize that this isn't good for me and to take responsibility for myself in my life because he's not living in my shoes. He doesn't have to go to sleep in my bed. I'm the one who's going to sleep at night in my bed. So I have to take responsibility for myself. Like it says in Pirkei Avot, if not me, then who? Right? If, if I'm not for myself, then who's going to be for me? Right? So part of this is utilizing your mind to figure these things out and then coming up with creative strategies to deal with it. 
And what about umaot vaotaot? Hu parnasa shetzenirik levadat Hashem. We know that you need a livelihood to be able to support yourself so that you can serve Hashem. How are you going to wear tefillin? You have to buy them. How are you going to buy them? You need to pay for them. Yeah? How are you going to do that? Either, you know, you go to work or you get to the level that you have a muna shlema, like Rabbi Nachman says, and you don't have to leave your apartment. But somehow money is going to have to come flying in. Either it's at the store or it's in your house, right? Somehow you're going to have to get your hand on some finances, right? So you need money in order to be able to Shabbat, right? You're supposed to get the nicest things that you can on that, on that day. So even if during the week you're eating bread with salt, you have nice things on Shabbat. It's a mitzvah. So how do I do that? I need parnasa for that, right? My spouse, they don't feel comfortable if they don't know how I'm going to pay my bills at the end of the month. Right? So it's a mitzvah to be able to give them that ease of mind, to know that at least theoretically it's, it's possible financially. You know, the numbers work out in a way that we could, we could theoretically support ourselves. Right? So <clears throat> that's a mitzvah. We need this because that gives us peace of mind. And Rabbi Nachman says in the 60th Torah of the Kutumran that many people say that you don't need money um, to serve Hashem. But I say that for the greatest levels of contemplation of Torah, you need the, all the money in the world. <laughs> so, <clears throat> uh, right, yeah, you know, interestingly, he also says there that people say that stories put you to sleep and I say stories wake you up. So that's what we're doing right now. That's the whole source for Sipoy Masiot. The last thing he says is that people say that stories don't make barren women pregnant, but I say that stories make barren women pregnant, Okay. So even though he means on the, on the literal note that if a barren woman were to read Sipuri Masiot, he will have a segula to be able to, to give birth. But it also means in general, any, any spiritual process in which I'm working on that's been a struggle for me, right? For me to be able to achieve this thing, I'm going to have to give birth to it. So in that sense, we're all barren women. And when we read these stories, it arouses us in a way that we're able to give birth to these things. Okay? So, Masha <clears throat> whatever it is that you need physically, you have that in order so you can go search for the princess. Motza et bad melech, to find this princess, jiteno lo kol tarich, to give her all that she needs. Ki aide ze bevadai mishalem melech, because for sure, on all of this, meaning whether it's your body or whether it's your mind or whether it's your parnasa, Hashem is going to give you all you need to find her. And this is something that we always speak about, but it's, it's something that we need to say over again. Whatever is your situation, whether you're physically healthy or you're not physically healthy, whether you are blessed with tremendous financial means or you're barely making it through the month, right? Whether your mind is cogent and clear or whether you're struggling to think. There is no situation that Hashem does not give you what you need to achieve your mission in, your, in this lifetime. And all the more so if you struggle in these areas that your soul is greater because Hashem will never give you a situation in which you cannot take the princess out of exile. He will not give you a situation that you cannot find joy so you have to say to yourself, Hashem, you gave me what I need. Help me to figure out within what I have how to find her. Because it's impossible that Hashem gave you a situation in which you cannot achieve your task in life. It could be that for you, the way you're going to do it is going to be something very creative, something very unique in ways that you never thought you would have to in order to achieve this thing. But you have it. And afterwards, after the fact, you're going to see that all the more so that you have to do um, out-of-the-box things in order to make yourself feel healthy enough to go find the princess, um, you're going to see the blessing in it. Like, I'll just give you an example. You know, I've spoken many times in the past about how sadness um, is something that I have a tremendous affinity to. You know, it's like almost like when people see cookies and they like, like, oh my gosh, I got to eat those cookies. Like, I'm not like that. I don't, I don't see cookies and I get like everything in my life stops and I, and I have to figure out a way to get the cookies. <clears throat> but when it comes to sadness, when I touch it or I taste it a little bit, it's sweet to me like a cookie. Yeah. 
and like I want to sit with it and I want to eat it. I want to chew on it. I want to go in a room alone and just relax with it. I want to, you know, comb its hair and spend time with it. <laughs> and even though I'm miserable when I'm doing it, I just have this tremendous connection to feeling yayus, feeling sadness, feeling despair, naturally. Now, obviously, it's not really my natural state of being. That was a challenge that was given to me to overcome. <clears throat> so therefore, for a person, let's say, that they can engage in things that are not spiritually so positive, but they can still manage to be happy, right? So for them, it's not going to be as incumbent upon them to take more steps to put themselves in a positive situation so that they don't spend time alone with sadness. But I have to go to crazy lengths to make sure that I am running away from sadness at all costs. So for me, that might mean, you know, spending more time dancing and singing every day. That might, that might mean spending more time listening to music in my car. That might mean uh, spending more time, um, let's say, working out or going for a job. That might mean me spending more time in my bodhidut, uh, not as much time doing tshuva and more time um, singing to Hashem and talking about all my good points, you know. And a person can feel when they're going through all of this, like, oh my gosh, I have to do so much to feel happy. It's like, why can't I just feel happy? Like this guy, you know, on the street, this simpleton, that he seems to always be happy and there's no reason for it. I like have to put in every ounce of koach to be able to achieve joy. So, but you have to, you have to, you know, like, like people always say to me, wow, Rabbi Nachman, what he asked you to do, it's so hard. It's so challenging to, to do all of these things. And I say it's true, it's very hard to, but it's harder not to, you know? It's harder, it's hard to, 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 to do the Savoda, it's hard to talk to Hashem every day, it's hard to learn like Rabbi Nachman says to, it's hard to constantly um, uh, connect yourself to positive things, and to, it's, it's hard to constantly put up fences to make sure that I'm not connecting myself to negative things. But on the other hand, is that harder than being depressed? I don't think so. You know, I've experienced it many times in my life. There's nothing harder than that. That's mamish hell. So even though this is very difficult, but I have to know that Hashem gave me a horse and He gave me a servant and He gave me money that I should be able to do what I need to do because Hashem wouldn't send me down to this world if I don't have what I need. And now after the fact, you can actually see that Be'emet in truth, it only goes to so show the strength of your soul. You know, because another person who doesn't have to deal with these challenges, they have their own challenges, it's a different challenge. But in this area, they don't have that challenge. It's because you have a greater strength of soul in this place. Like Rabbi Nachman teaches, any place in which you struggle with, don't think that that's because that's inherently a part of your soul. It's adra, but it's the opposite. If you struggle with this thing, it's because in potential you have the opposite. So again, what does that mean? That means that if a person like me struggles with sadness, it's because be'emet in truth in my soul, I have a greater capacity for joy. I just never experienced it because I need to have a counterforce to the power of my soul. So if the power of my soul is to ex experience extreme simcha, unbelievable joy, even more so than my neighbor, so then in order for me to come down to this world, I'm going to have something which is counter to that. Otherwise, I can't choose to be happy. And everything in life is about choosing. You need to choose to be happy. It's not about just allowing yourself to be. I need to choose to have peace in my life. I'm not just going to be at peace. I need to choose my life. The whole essence, Rabbi Nachman says, of this world is choosing. Everything Rabbi Nachman says that happens in your life is only to give you a new choice. That's it. To choose. Do I want to be happy now or not? Not to think to yourself, oh, these things that took place in my life, now I'm not happy. Like my son yesterday. <laughs> he went to go play with his friends. And he went to one of his friends' house and his friend wasn't there. He went to another one of his friends' house. His friend wasn't there. He went to another one of his friends' house. His friends wasn't there. So those are his three friends. Buch Hashem. So he came back after that. And uh, he came home and I saw when he walked in, you know, it's a, it's a very empowering thing. You learn so much from your kids. I could see from his face. He wasn't crying, but I could see from his face he wanted to. And he went straight into his room. And I was with a guest. And I said, I'm so sorry. Hold on one second. 
And I walked into the room and as soon as my son saw me, he starts crying. I said, what happened? He said, uh, ah, 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 ah. I was like, I was like, Sheila, I can't hear you. Like, you, ah, 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 ah. you know, I was like, I was like, just, just breathe, breathe, breathe. Tell me what happened. He goes, oh, my friends, they, they left me. They're not there. I said, what you went, you went to hang out with them and they, and they, and they went, they went, to, they, they ran away from you. Like they, they didn't want to play with you. He goes, no, I went there. Nobody was home. I go, oh, they didn't leave you. They just weren't home when you went there. He said, yeah, yeah, I don't know what happened. I was like, uh, yeah, you know, she goes, sometimes that happens. Do you ever notice, you know, your friends come here sometimes and you're, you're out at school, you're with mom, you know? He's like, yeah, yeah. I was like, did you do that to hurt them? Did you know they weren't going to be there? Like, was it, was it on your part to, to make sure that they knew that you had alienated yourself from them? He's like, no. I was like, so what? I was like, why do you think that? Because you went to your friend's house and they weren't there. Like, something is inherently wrong in the world now, <laughs> you know? They're just not there right now. In a few minutes, they'll probably be back. Don't worry about it. He goes, no, 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 no. I'm sad. I'm sad. I'm sad. So I said, I said, Sheila, do you believe in Hashem? So he said, yeah. I said, and do you think that Hashem would make it that your friends are not home because he wants you to be sad? He goes, no, but it's making me sad. So I, I was trying to explain to him. I said, it's very hard, you know. How do you take these teachings and give them down to like a five-year-old? You know, I don't even know how to give it to you guys. <laughs> so all the more so, my, my own children. Um, I, said, I said, Sheila, you have to understand you choose whether you're happy or not. Rabbi Nachman says that the entire war of the Yetzir Tov and the Yetzir which my son knows what that is, Yetzir Tov and Yetzir Bo Hashem, he says the entire war of the Yetzir Tov and the Yetzir is the war between happiness and sadness. That one Yetzir represents his capacity, his proclivity to want to be sad. And his Yetzir Tov is his proclivity, his desire to want to be happy. Now, we know that the whole entire ikar of our life in this world is to choose our Yetzir Tov over Yetzir right? The Gemara says that you need to be proactive to strengthen and empower your Yetzir Tov. It's not a matter of my Yetzir Tov is just going to shine through. No, Yaakov and Esav are constantly at war. We need to choose to be happy. And I don't know if I succeeded because I'm not sure how to explain that to a five-year-old. But to you guys, I can tell you the same thing. And this is something that I, I have worked tirelessly for over half a decade to, 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 to internalize. If I'm not happy, I can choose to be happy. I can choose that. Now, you could have never convinced me that in my whole life. And I would never believe you because my happiness is obviously dependent on my circumstances. But I'm wrong. You're wrong. You have the choice at every moment. This is what Rabbi Nachman is teaching us. You can choose to be happy. How can I do that? You know, it says in uh, Masechet Brachot that when you get good news, you're supposed to say, Baruch Tov Emetiv. Blessed is the one who's good and who does good. Talking about Hashem. And when you receive bad news, you have to say, Baruch Diana Emet. Blessed is the one who's the true judge. What does that mean? That means that this negative news, even though, yes, in my ears, in this world, this feels bad, seems bad. But we know that for sure Hashem is overseeing everything. And even if I can't understand whatever He's doing is good, even though I don't understand that he's a real judge. He's not like the judge in the American court system where you pay him a certain amount of money or you get the best lawyer. And even though this guy's like a flaming murderer, but he has a very good lawyer that he... And he's like, you know, he's, he's innocent until proven guilty. Okay, but the guy just killed 10 people. Like, you know, it's like, no, 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 no. I'm going to come up with a thousand strategies to get this guy off. Like, that's how the American court system works. Whoever has the better lawyer wins. That's not justice. <laughs> that's corruption. <laughs> okay? Hashem doesn't work like that. He knows exactly what's going on all the time. He's a true judge. So when something seemingly negative happens, even though we don't understand and even though it hurts, Baruch Dayan Emet. It's a mitzvah to say that. Now the next Mishnah comes up and it says something unbelievable. 
It says not only are you supposed to say it, you're supposed to say it in the same way you say, Baruch uh, Tova Metiv. Blessed is the one who's good who does good. So the Mishnah comes out and explains, meaning the same simcha, the same joy, the same way that you said, wow, Hashem is so good when you heard good news. That's the same way you're supposed to say, Baruch Tayin Emet. The unbelievable thing. Not like, oh, because you don't want the guy to see you because he's you're religious and you like just started wearing a kippah and you like you know, you want him to think you're crazy yeah no both dynamic yes <laughs> I'll tell you a crazy story which is not so crazy you know when you start to learn these things it, it should give you a lot of chizuk uh, Rav Levi Yitzchak Bender who is the who was the leader of the Breslover Hasidim. Um, for, for, for the majority of the past uh, 100 years. He grew up in Poland, and he ended up getting connected to Breslov Chassidut as a kid. He became on fire from it. He moved to Uman, and he ended up living there for a period of time, uh, learning from people who were Rav Natan's grandson, you know, people who had direct lineage to the whole source of Breslov. And um, he lived with these teachings in such a genu- genuine, innocent, um, like non-sophisticated, is like unbelievable. If you can ever get your hands on any stories about him, it, it's going to blow your mind how he lived with Rabbi Nachman's teachings with such um, tamima, such innocence and authenticity. Like, I believe this more than I believe whatever I see in the world. So, <clears throat> he started to get into a lot of legal trouble, trouble as his students grew, he never called them his students, he only called them his friends, but um, as time went on and people began to gravitate towards him because he was this tremendous charismatic and passionate um, figure who was just blazing with Amuna, faith. So, you know, he would do whatever it took, even in a government that they were putting decrees on you. Um, You would get sent to Siberia if they caught you learning Torah, um, X, Y, and Z. So he actually became like a marked man at one point. Um, very much so that the entire like Russian government was looking for him for many, many, many years. Um, and he had to escape death multiple times. Okay. So one story of this is that they finally caught him one time. And literally all this guy does at this point is he learns and he prays and he does, he bow do it and he teaches and that's it. <laughs> it's his whole entire life. He couldn't be leave, living like a more societally, uh, yeah, societally um, helpful way. He doesn't do anything hurtful to anybody. And yet he is like literally a marked man by the Russian government. Okay, this is the way of a breast lover chassid in this world. You know, this is, this is what we have to deal with. So they're coming after him. And finally they catch him. Okay. They put him in chains. And there's another guy who's also in chains. You know, it's not like now that they have these handcuffs. The mom is chains. They would put you in chains. And it wasn't like it is now that you get a court date, which can be like five years from now, and your lawyer can keep pushing it off until you pass away. Yeah. So, like, you, you have to, they, they take you from when you get arrested to court, where that guy was, like, already paid off, and the, the, the decree is already determined, and you're going to go to jail for an uh, unforeseeable amount of time. And, you know, hopefully one day, like, someone lets me out or something takes place. So they take him out with this guy next to him. And they're both, and this this guy next to him is crying. And Rav Levi Yitzchak, he said to him, why are you crying? He said, what are you talking about? He goes, we just got arrested by the government. We didn't do anything. We could go to jail for, like, an unforeseeable amount of time. Like, the, the government's completely corrupt. Like, how are you not crying? So he said to him, <laughs> he said, you see these chains? And he said, yeah. He goes, what color are they? He said, they're gold. He said, okay. He said, what's the difference between these chains and the ones that you spend all week working for money so that you can go buy them at the store? He's like, what the heck are you talking about? <laughs> For Rav Levi Yitzchak, there's no difference between the gold chains you buy at the store and the gold chains that the government put on him because everything's from Hashem. This is what the Breslover Chassid has like brought into his... There's literally no difference. 
Sometimes Hashem wants me to buy the gold chains at the store. Sometimes Hashem wants me to put them, put myself in chains to go to jail. <laughs> you know, like this, this is how it works sometimes, you know? But it's all from Hashem. So now they're like walking there. He's got a big smile on his face. This guy thinks he's out of his mind. They get to court. And they walk in and the court says, guilty! 15 years in prison. And then afterwards we'll, we'll sing. And they didn't do anything. Literally, both of them did nothing. This guy hears the news, he goes, ah, and he puts his head down and he starts crying hysterically. He can't believe it. And Rav Levi Yitzchak stands up and he goes, Baruch Emmet! <laughs> Tremendous simcha. The same way, because he wants to fulfill the mitzvah, you know, you have to say Baruch Dayan Emmet on bad news, just like good news, because it's all coming from Hashem. Okay? They bring him to prison. Literally, three days into the prison, they're going around with a razor to shave everybody's head, shave everybody's beard, give them the prison clothes, whatever. And now, for the first time, Rav Levi Yitzchak is concerned. Has v'chalila, they should shave my beard. <laughs> so, so he's going around shaving everybody's hair, and he's, he's in his room, and he starts crying in the cell. Hashem, you can't do this. I can't do this. No, 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 they can't shave my beard. Yeah? He's crying, and the guy's coming closer, you know, with the, with the shaver. And finally, he gets to his room, and now he just starts breaking out in tears, and he's crying at the top of his lungs, screaming, Hashem, Hashem. And the guy's looking at him like, he's like, dude, relax, you know, we're just cutting your hair. And he's like, no, you know. So then the guy, <laughs> he takes the razor, and he's about to put it on, and literally, the thing pops out of the razor. Okay, like the thing just like comes out. So then when he, he realizes, like, I guess it got dull and it's not fitting anymore. So he said, I'll be back in one minute. I just have to fix the razor. As he goes back to go fix the razor, um, the government actually has an invasion from another nearby country. They take over the government and they release everybody from prison. Okay. So this person, Rav Levi Yitzchak's 15-year sentence at the least, and at most, maybe the rest of his life, or sent to Siberia, ended up being a three-day sentence. He was in jail for three days. Now, we can all imagine in our own personal lives how we've been through certain things and how we respond to those things, right? Rav Levi Yitzchak had every reason in this situation to be sad. And at each opportunity, he chose, chose, he chose to be happy. Not that it's easy for him. He chose to. Why? And we're going to see. Because part of the ability to choose to be happy is being connected to a real tzaddik. Because when you're continually learning the teachings of a real tzaddik and you're following his advice and you're working to internalize them, then when difficulties and challenges arise, I'm able to actually apply those things in my life. And now I have more ammo, so to speak, to shoot this weapon of simcha. Whereas before I wasn't able, I didn't have the strength to be able to fight my challenges and experience them with joy. I didn't have that before. But as time goes on, you're going to have more and more strength and more and more tools to choose joy. But no matter what, even if you have more tools than anybody in the world, you're still going to have to choose it. Because this whole world is about choosing. It's about choosing. Okay? So he's adding this very subtle point, which is fascinating. He went to go search for her for a long time. A very long time. Until that he found her. What's the essence that's being said here? That it takes a long time. You know, many of us, when we start our spiritual journeys, we think to ourselves, oh my gosh, finally, I realize Hashem exists. I'm a Jew. The whole world was literally created for me to be able to heal the world. Yeah, I'm excited now. I'm, a, I'm on a mission. You know, Hashem loves me. And, you, and, you, and a person thinks to themselves, like, now all my problems are going to go away. Right? And they see that they don't. And it's very disheartening. And it's very painful. But the main reason it hurts so much is not because 
um, it hasn't gone away, it's because we think it's supposed to happen immediately. When in reality, we see from the very beginning of the story that for the Viceroy, which is us, this is going to take a long time. It's going to take time. Zman Maruba, Me'od, a very long time. Keep it chila, because in the beginning, Nid Mela Dam Shilech Lo Bekalot, because he thinks in the beginning it's going to end up being easy for him to do this. Likadesh Liot Ish Kasher, to become a kosher person, to be able to keep the mitzvah, to be able to connect to Hashem, to be able to finally achieve joy, to do all these things that I'm learning about now. They think in the beginning it's going to be easy. This kot legilui shechina, that I'm going to be able to reveal the shechina in my life. Hainu, meaning like Rabbi Nachman says, to feel in my heart awe of Hashem and love of Hashem. To get to the point that just like I love candy, I love Hashem. To get to the point that just like I'm in awe of the police and, I'm, and, I, and I don't want to do something that's going to put me in a negative position, that I can literally have awe of Hashem, that I can feel His presence all around me. Those feelings are called the shechina herself. Because they take place in the heart. So we think to ourselves, okay, it's going to be easy for me to, to figure this out. How I'm going to love Hashem. How I'm going to have awe of Hashem. And then as years go on and you realize it's not happening. Yeah, I have never felt real love for Hashem. I never really felt awe of Hashem. Like I feel Him all around me, holding me, protecting me. Right? So then it gets very disheartening. Or like Rabbi Nachman says in the first Torah, look at Imran that uh, the ikar of an ish Yisraeli, the essence of a Jew, is to be able to find the seichel in everything, meaning to find Hashem hidden within everything. So he thinks, when I read that first lesson in the Kutumran, okay, now I'm going to put on my Amuna glasses, I'm going to start walking around, and laser into different things, and see Hashem in everything. And then what do I find? Oh, I just see a guitar. Oh, I just see my mom yelling at me. Oh, I just see my husband, he's still giving me a hard time, yeah? So like, what happened to being able to see the seichel in everything? I thought I was going to be able to do that. And thus, <clears throat> in a moment, he starts to feel the heaviness of everything that's going on with him. He sees it's taking him a long time. So what happens? He falls and he falls into despair. Why is he falling into despair? He's falling into despair because it's taking a long time and he didn't think it would take a long time. That's the main reason why. It's not because it's hard. It's not because it's a struggle. You know, if you put in front of a person a plan and you say this plan is going to take 20 years, but this is how it's going to look every year, right? There's a, there's a plan, there's a curriculum, you're going to do this, you're going to accomplish this, and then next year you're going to do this. I give you 20 years, right? If it goes according to that plan, even if it takes tremendous amount of work, even if it's a 24-7 job, even if it's uh, moving you and pushing you beyond your boundaries, but if you know that the end of all this time, you're going to achieve the goal, you will never despair. But for us that we don't know how long it takes, and we don't know that we're doing it in the right way, we don't even know if we're being effective in what we're trying to do. So what happens when we start to learn Rabbi Nachman's teachings and for the first time in truth, I'm really trying to connect to Hashem. I'm speaking to Him for a period of time a day. I'm learning His teachings. I'm trying my best to fulfill His advice. And I'm also trying to keep the mitzvot. I'm trying to learn Torah. I'm trying to go to a minion if I'm a man. I'm trying to, um, you know, whatever. All the different things that uh, are part of the Jewish life. And we see that I feel the same. I'm not getting any less angry. I'm not getting any, uh, I don't feel any more faith. I don't feel any more joy, right? I'm not, I'm not experiencing love of Hashem. I'm not experiencing all of Hashem. And you start to go into yayush. You start to go into despair because I thought this was going to happen much sooner than this. I mean, it's been five years, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years. Like clearly this is just not working for me. It's not going to happen. So comes Rabbi Nachman to tell you in the beginning of the story, even before we learn about the second to the king's journeys to find the princess. It takes a very long time until he finds her. But what he's going to say is, but in the end, he finds her. And this is what Rabbi Nachman is trying to bring to us now. This very important point. Rabbeinu HaKadosh Malabach Chiderach 
He's explaining to us, he's teaching us about the path of the search. That it takes a very long time. So he shouldn't weaken in his mind. And he shouldn't become depleted in his spirit. That he sees that it's taking him such a long time. To find the lost princess. To find joy in one's life. To lift the Shekhinah up from the dust. To acquire this thing called a Muna. And I haven't found her yet. But you should know, Rabbi Nachman says, that in the end, he finds her. And this is the ikr to getting to her. To know that even though we're going to have to travel for, through deserts and rivers and mountains and, you know, what was that story? I see bears and lions and tigers, oh my, you know? We're going to have to do that. But at the end of the day, you have to know you will find her. The only way that you get to that point is to know that no matter how long it takes and no matter what you have to go through, if you do not give up, you will find her in the end. That will give you the strength to continue going always. So we see even from the beginning of the story, and we haven't even learned about any of the travails of the second to the king. And we're going to see he has a very difficult life. He has to go through tremendous trials and tribulations to go find the king's daughter for the king. He's not even doing it for himself. He wants to return the Shekhinah back to Hashem. He wants to return this broken Jewish heart back to the one who created him. And yet he, it takes a very long time. But you have to know, Be'emet, 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 Be'emet. You have to always keep saying to yourself, in the end, he finds her. But in the end, he finds her. But in the end, he finds her. If you have to look at the beginning of the story every day, do it. Look at it. He searches for her a very long time, but in the end, he finds her. Keep reading it until you have literally hammered it into your heart. Because that's the only way to get there. You know, there's so many people that inspire us, so many people that encourage us, so many people that, um, you know, are heroic to us. You never hear some guy at a motivation speech, like after, you know, 30 years of doing something, 40 years of doing something, he gets up and he gives some inspirational speech and he talks about how this was a very short process for me. I figured this out in five seconds and it was so easy. Yay! Wow, this guy's unbelievable. No, it's like this guy's parents died when he was a kid. He was bullied by his friends. He had developmental disability. He was struggling with this. He was poor and like, you know, and like literally uh, he, he had an idea in business and everybody thought he was a joke and he started in for the first 10 years. Nothing happened, but he just kept coming every day and trying again. And then all of a sudden something happened where he had one customer and this one customer showed it to a thousand people and a thousand people became like a million people. Like <clears throat> it was a hard, long process. Always. That's the one thing that comes out of all of these people's speeches. It was a tremendously difficult journey, but I did not give up. And in the end, this is what happened. That's what is inspirational to us. And we have to know it's no different for us in our spiritual journey. It's the same thing at the end of the day. Think to yourself, okay, yes, it's been five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years since I started Be'emet trying to work on learning Rabbi Nachman's teachings and bringing them into my life. But in truth, whoever achieves something that's truly so heroic, that's so transformative, that's so life-changing, that's so world-changing, that didn't go through tremendous trials and tribulations and had tremendous perseverance in order to be able to achieve it. That never happened in history. So why should in my spiritual journey it should be easier? It's not easier. Now, Bo Hashem, we have a real teacher now. And this is the most important thing. Because he has shoulders to carry the load. I don't have to carry it myself anymore. I know that I have good advice, I have sound advice to, to follow through with. I have wisdom that is rooted back to Har Sinai, yeah? I don't have to doubt anymore the content um, or the application that I'm trying to do these things. The only thing is I need to be able to gird my loins and I need to strengthen myself and I need to continue to start over again to choose joy, to choose faith, to choose Amuna. And it's hard, but in the end, you will find her. And you have to keep reminding yourself that. 
because that will give you the strength to get there in the end. And this is the reason. Why in truth, thus this is the path. That every good thing takes a long time. And the reason is because of something logical. A person is not fitting to experience the Shekhinah, the presence of God, to attach themselves and to cling to something which is completely ephemeral, which is something completely spiritual and elevated. And to mamish feel ecstasy with Hashem, to feel delight with Hashem, to feel unbelievable joy just through spiritual means. The only reason we're capable of doing this, despite the fact that we're physical beings, is because Hashem loves us. And because He's compassionate. In order to arouse this quality of Rachamim, we need to have a tremendous amount of desire and a tremendous amount of yearning. Shazman Rav. This is what it takes a long time. We're going to see in this story that when the viceroy finally sees the princess, he asks her, is there any way I can get you out of here? And she's going to say to him, yes. But you're going to have to, every single day, go to the same place and spend time there yearning to free me from here. And after a year, if you do this every single day without fail, that you take a time alone by yourself and you yearn to take me out of this place, then at the end of the year, you will take me out of here. Why couldn't he take her out right away? Right? Seemingly, there's no practical reason why it shouldn't be the case. Clearly, we see that the ability to connect ourselves with something which is only good and completely spiritual, it takes a lot of yearning to be able to do that. You need to want that very bad. You know, you hear about athletes, let's say, what they had to sacrifice in their life to be able to become professional athletes where they put a rubber ball into a hoop. <laughs> And it takes them decades of self-sacrifice to be able to get to the point that they're skilled enough to be able to get the ball in the hoop against another guy who's trying to stop you. And us, that we're trying to literally completely transform our lives, to elevate ourselves, that our physical body should be a makum, should be a place where the revelation of Hashem takes place. The Shekhinah is literally glowing through my face. That's so much more meaningful than putting a rubber ball into a hoop. How much more so is that going to take Zman Rav a long time? And it's okay. Because at the end of the day, it's not the fact that it's a long time that's troubling me. It's the fact that I don't know that at the end of the day, she, he finds her. That's what's causing me pain, that I don't know if in the end of the day I will find her. That's what you have to realize. You will. Zman Rav, yes, Zman Rav, it's going to take a long time. But at the end of the day, he finds her. It's explained in the uh, 60th lesson of the Kutumran. The quality of Rachamim, compassion, is the concept of length of days. Meaning that the only way to engender Hashem's compassion is to do something for an extended period of time. The lesson is very deep. I'm not going to um, explain now how that works. But suffice it to say, the only way to experience the highest level of Hashem's compassion is to, over the course of a period of many days, to yearn and, and toil spiritually in order to engender that. It takes man rav. It takes a long time because you have to come with length of days. Like it says, Avram Avinu, at the end of his life, it said that he had... Uh, he had accrued many days. So all it has to say is he passed away at this age. We don't have to know that at the end of his life, all of his days gathered up. But what we learn from this is a very deep thing. It takes the many days of one's life that I uh, um, take one day and I do the best I can today, whatever that looks like. And then I need the next day, I do the same thing. And I need the next day and I do the same thing. And at the end of my life, my life is the collection of all of these days. And when all of these days come together and I have length of days, then I see Hashem's Rachamim. 
Because rachamim, compassion requires length of days. So not to think to myself, something's wrong because this is taking a long time. No. If you want a tik yomin, if you want the compassion that comes from the ancient of days, we need to have length of days. That's how it works. It's okay. It's totally fine that it's taking a long time. The only reason it's bothering us, Be'emet, is because we're not sure we're going to find her. That's it. So hammer this into your heart. He finds her in the end. He finds her in the end. He finds her in the end. When you're done with this class and you're going to eat to dude, say, he finds her in the end. He finds her in the end. He finds her in the end. Keep saying it over and over and over again and let the tears come down from your eyes. He finds her in the end. Do not worry, no matter what, whether it's a desert or it's a forest or it's a field or whether there's giants that come up like we're going to see, whether he falls asleep for many years of his life. It makes no difference. At the end of the day, he finds her. He finds her. We're doing this all in order to arouse the need to desire this thing that's called length of days. So, Bezat Hashem, next week we're going to continue the story, but we've introduced this heroic figure called the, the Viceroy, the second to the king. And it's, he's so heroic that he sees the pain of his father when he can't find his daughter. And he says, I got this. I'm going to do it. Give me these three things and I'm going to go find her. Give me a body. Give me a mind. Give me physical sustenance. And I'm going to go find your princess. And even though it's going to take Zman Rav a very long time, at the end of the day, he finds her. And this is what we need to come out of this class with. No matter what, he finds her. Does anybody have any class in, uh, questions from today's class? No? Okay. Everybody have an amazing week. Try to really uh, internalize what we spoke about. Zman Rav. A long time. I'm going to send you Bezbeth Hashem a song from Yosef Karduner uh, that he wrote about the Zman Rav. The long time. And it's, uh, it's a beautiful song. And at the end, he brings a teaching from Sefer Midot. The teachings that Rabbi Nachman uh, wrote out when he was uh, in his early years of youth, when he was a child, actually, you know. Uh, and he wrote there, Biat HaMashiach, the coming of the Mashiach, Tului Bikarev Tzadik. It's dependent on coming close to the Tzadik. He wrote that as a little kid, okay? Lest you think that, like, he becomes a big Tzadik, and then he just wants everybody to be close to him, and he says it's going to be good for you, even before he became that big Tzadik. He says, there's such a mitziyut, there's a reality as for a person to experience Mashiach in their personal life or for the Jewish people to experience the Mashiach at large. Biata Mashiach to Louis Bikarev Tzadik. That the coming of the Mashiach is dependent on coming close to the real Tzadik. Also the real Tzadik within you. The second to the king. Everybody have an amazing week. <laughs>